press on from diagnosis to diagnostic. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Olivier, for your kind introduction. Yeah, you will see better on that. <laughs> Good. <clears throat> so um, this lecture has been very difficult to put together because Andrea, and I'd like to thank her very much for inviting me, only gave me 30 minutes, and really it needs an hour. So I'm going to have to miss out a lot of stuff. And what I've basically done is to try and downplay the animal work. I've had, a, had to keep a little bit and try and direct the um, direction towards uh, uh, more human uh, uh, aspects. And then we'll get to some um, therapeutics uh, toward the end. So I'm going to start with an introduction because I think some people might not be very familiar with how we currently use microbubbles in a routine kind of a way. Um, but uh, these are the topics I'll try to cover. Um, some conventional detection, mainly for the liver. It's licensed also for the breast, a curious curiosity that's kind of lingered on in the, in, in the product leaflet. And then we'll talk about some targeted bubbles, and there's been a lot of development there, and then on to um, some therapeutic um, applications. And finally, I'll talk about a new area, which I think is very exciting indeed, the field of nanodroplets. So just by way of introduction, this is the, uh, a fairly, well, it's actually a bubble that's not used anymore, but it's uh, quite typical of what's going on. And that's a 10 micron scale right at the top. So you can get an idea of the size and the distribution of sizes um, of these micro bubbles. Um, and essentially, they're a gas with a shell around them. And the, the oh, I think I have to make that play again. Um, the, 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 the thing to hang on to, the, the, the key point about how they behave that makes them useful as diagnostic and then later as therapeutic agents is the fact that unlike um, soft tissues in the body, um, they are very much compressible. So when the ultrasound pressure and rarefaction waves strike a microbubble, it sets them off into a, a, an, an oscillation, as you can see on this um, image here. Just bear in mind that's a 10 micron mi microbubble. So red cell size, a bit less really, 10 at its maximum size. Um, and this is a 1 million uh, 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 frames per second image, that, uh, a movie that slowed right down. And it comes from the Rotterdam group in Holland. <clears throat> so that's typical of what they do. Um, but we couldn't really use that if there wasn't a, a, an additional um, twist to the story. And that is that when you uh, apply a pressure and rarefaction wave illustrated in the top line to a microbubble, as you've seen, it changes its size and it follows the pressure and rarefaction waves in quite a, a, a predictable way. But when you turn the, the um, mechanical index, the term we use for the pressure applied, when you turn it a little bit higher, it starts to resist being compressed a little bit more than it allows for, uh, uh, for expansion. And so its size changes no longer mirror the sinusoidal pattern of the pressure and rarefaction waves that you've applied and instead you get these sharp corners and these um, sharpnesses carry overtones just like in a, in, in a musical instrument um, and they are the harmonics and the circuitry that picks them up uses the harmonics to display the microbubble signal separately from the tissue signal and the, the separation is really rather good. It's not perfect of course but it's pretty good. So I'd like to show you just one example of a patient in whom this was useful. Um, but uh, just to explain the background, we work at a low MI because we don't want to destroy the bubbles. They're very sensitive to high pressures. It breaks them. Um, and so we work at a low MI. Um, and um, we generally use a, a bolus injection. The volumes used are very much smaller than are used in CT and MR. Typically, we use 2.5 or even half that um, ML um, for, for an individual um, a, 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 a bubble study. And then we get obviously an arterial wash in and a, and a venous wash out phase, and we track those usually just by eye, but it's possible to um, do it uh, 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 quantitatively as well. And then, and this is really a very special point about these microbubbles, completely by chance, it wasn't engineered in at all. Um, and many of them, and particularly the one that we use routinely, Sonovu from Braco, has a late liver sp and spleen specific phase that sl lasts long after the microbubbles have left the bloodstream. So somehow, and it's not exactly clear what's going on, they're trapped in the sinusoidal structure of the liver and this equivalent in, in the spleen. Um, and the key point about this is that, um, as not at all a surprise, malignancies, of course, don't have a sinusoidal apparatus. So in this late phase, they appear as a defect. And I'll show you an example, and I know Chris Harvey's got uh, many others to show you in the next uh, session. 